Sure. So uh, tell us about uh, Nexus as a blockchain. How do you maintain its quantum resistance um, without using a master private key? Um, I noted that the seed phrases are changeable. Um, so how, how does how does it? Um, what's your um, reasoning behind having a master private key or having changeable seed phrases? How, how do you maintain a you know a fearless quantum yeah. secured system like that? That's a really good question. Um, so the the seed phrases and the username and password pin login system is not necessarily to make it quantum resistant. It does. Based on the signature chain architecture, that helps. So basically what a sig chain does is you generate a new key every transaction, and then that key remains hashed. And so as soon as you reveal that key, then a new key is created to replace it. And then there's also another mechanism on the network where um, geometric, I guess, uh, progression of the transaction, which means that it, it expands out one node, gets the transaction, and sends it to all its other nodes, it sends it to all those nodes, base to exponential expansion. Um, that basically there's a, a locking mechanism in the memory pool so that if somebody else tries to, let's say, oh, hey, I've, I've, I got your public key because you just created a transaction and then I have a quantum computer and I can try to break it. Even if you're not using post-quantum cryptography, let's say he's ECDSA um, and you break it within one second, your probability is still very, very low that you'd actually get that transaction pushed through. So there's that mechanism, which is you know the locking mechanism in the memory pool and then the generating the new key. So that actually allows you to use ECDSA in a relatively safe manner, right? It, it, it automatically enforces that rule. Or with Bitcoin, you know, if you don't reuse or use a different key every time, which like for instance, exchanges, you have the same exchange address. So all those exchange addresses are gonna be vulnerable because as soon as you've withdrawn, those public keys are vulnerable and then they can be cracked. But we also use another uh, algorithm called Falcon. It stands for fast Fourier lattice-based compact signatures over NTRU. I know it's a mouthful of words, but <laughs> essentially it's it's lattice-based cryptography. So think of lattices as just kind of uh, big groups of collections of points that follow a similar mathematical algorithm. So you create these 10, 20,000 dimensional lattices. These specific ones are called an NTRU lattice, and they don't have any known post-quantum vulnerabilities such as, you know, ECDSA suffers from breaking the discrete logarithmic problem. And that's what most Bitcoin transaction user RSA is the integer factorization problem. Those two algorithms are broken with a quantum computer with about 1,792 logical qubits. The physical qubits based on the quantum noise, you know, is debatable. Some people claim 100,000 or whatever, but all in all, it's getting close, right? So, <clears throat> but to go back into uh, the, the signature chain, right? That architecture has many, many different uses. For one, I explained how you're, you're rekeying so that it's basically one-time use keys. It treats every key as if it's insecure as soon as it's published. And then that also has, you have the memory pool locking, which prevents somebody from creating conflicted transaction. So, you know, a, a typical double spend would be, I buy merchandise, I send a transaction to you, I get away with the merchandise, and then I send a conflicting transaction that then spends those inputs I just sent to you back to myself. And that's your typical type of double spend. So it protects against that Another thing is signature chain, right? So um, a signature chain is kind of like a personal blockchain. So you get this kind of pseudo anonymous digital identity where you can see, you know, the assets you have associated. Um, you have a history that develops trust, but you also only have to keep the first and last signature. So your signature is the biggest, uh, I guess, data requirement in, in a blockchain, right? Your typical ECDSA signature, if it's uh, 256 bit, I think it's 96 bytes, if I remember that correctly, something like that. So that's where segregated witness, you know, they wanted to segregate the this transaction signature from the TXID and have a witness that was a separate, you know, to verify that that signature was valid, um, which is good. We do segregated witness architecture. Your TXID does not include the actual signature because you can do transaction mutation attacks where um, malleability, sorry, is the correct terminology where you, you can resign the same transaction with a different signature, but it's still equally valid with the same inputs and you get different TXIDs, which messes with the mempool and stuff. And that's a, that's a flaw in Bitcoin. Um, so, but the biggest thing architecturally is you don't have to save all these signatures. So when you're dealing with post-quantum signatures like Falcon, it's the most compact one. And it is about, I think, 850 bytes for the public key and like 900 to a thousand bytes for the signature. So you're talking uh, almost two kilobytes, a kilobyte and a half to two kilobytes per signature, right? Now, if you add this into a UTXO architecture, every input has to be signed. And that's how dust spam attacks happen. You just send like, I'm, 
I'm spending 0 0.000001 Bitcoin and it still requires one signature and then the next input and the next input, so on and so forth. So you could have these really, really, really large inefficient transactions. Um, signature chains, it only requires one transaction for a maximum of 100 contracts, right? So you get this really nice aggregation, but then you only have to keep that first and last because since it's a, a it's, its own personal blockchain, as long as you have a sign of the first and the signing of the last, then all of those previous TX IDs are chained in. So that means that the, it's basically sealed with the first signature and sealed with the last one. So when you get to a thousand transactions, now you've saved about a megabyte of disk space per user. When you get to you know a million, now you've saved about one or two gigabytes per user, right? So as as you use more transactions, then it essentially it scales up the data usage very very efficiently. So that's another really good part of the signature chains. Now we could have done a uh, root you know private key that changes saved on your disk and a wallet that that just like bitcoin with that architecture it doesn't necessitate username password pin but we did that the username password and pin because one of the biggest use case problems i've seen with bitcoin is people lose their keys right it's another big issue with uh, encryption applications right if i have you know a decentralized digital identity that i vote on and whatever else and I lose my key because I dropped my phone in the water or, you know, I mean, I've had my daughter's phone got put in the washer by my other daughter. And, you know, I mean, these things happen and that that phone is gone and you lose all your private keys. Right. I think the frozen Bitcoins, I think more Bitcoins have been lost than actually stolen. Right. And there's if you remember when Bitcoin first blew up, there was horror stories of somebody like whose girlfriend didn't like the fan noise on their computer. So they stopped mining Bitcoin. They had like 10,000 Bitcoins on it. And then they eventually threw that hard drive away and Bitcoin blows up. And they're like, oh, my gosh, it's worth 10 to 100 million dollars now. What the crap? And they, they actually go to the dumps and try to find it. And I mean, it's bad. Right. So that's a huge usability issue that I've seen. I've, I've done this also by sampling people, right? I don't, I didn't design Nexus just saying I, I have all these problems solved. I talked to people. I talked to a lot of Fortune 100 companies. So 2018, 2019, I was very fortunate to be able to talk to a lot of these these larger companies. What do you see blockchain as? What do you see it, you know, being in your system? How do you think it can improve, you know, the efficiency of your systems? And then, you know, what are some drawbacks? And same with just random people in the park, sample them. Hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? They're like, yeah, okay. Hey, what did you, well, I had Bitcoin once and I got like $50,000 worth of Bitcoin. And then I uninstalled the Bitcoin app because I didn't think I still had to have it because I'm just used to online bank. And then my coins were gone. And I was like, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> and it happens a lot. And then I think that just eventually will erode trust or, you know, <laughs> It will also encourage custodial services, right? Which one of the ethos of crypto is not your keys, not your crypto. And that's one thing that finance has been really putting on is, hey, you know, it's it's better for you to keep your coins here because we're going to keep them safe and we're going to insure it with, you know, our, our what is it? The the fund, whatever they call it, the the SAFU fund, you know, and try to play in on the HODL and whatever. And, you know, it's, it's just, it just recreates the same banking system, right? So if, you know, and people are also not used to having to manage things like that. They're used to being, you know, remembering their password and, you know, their username and PIN, but sometimes they forget that. So that's why we created the recovery system so that you can have, you know, 10, 20 words. You can give 10 to your friend and 10 to your mom or whatever else, or you can write it on a piece of paper and keep it in a safe. And then you can always recover your account because people forget their passwords, right? Mm -hmm. So we did that for ease of use and also for integrating dApps, okay? Because let's say you have decentralized social media and your social media identity is based around signatures from your private key, which is basically how it has to work. Where is that key going to be stored? Okay, is it stored on my device? Okay, now I've lost access to my social media account. I even had that happen on Keybase. It was this this encrypted Slack, and I just was like, I don't like this thing. It sucks and whatever. I I uninstalled the app, and it's like, oh, <laughs> I lost my keys. Now I can't get back into my Keybase account, right? And I had to go through this whole account reset system where it, like reset my keys and whatever, and deleted all my data, and then I could kind of pseudo access it again, but management is a huge, huge, huge issue, and we can't give people too big of a transition right like you can't just go from like totally having this custodial the bank insures my money up to two hundred fifty thousand. if i forget my password i go yell at someone if something bad happens i call customer support and blame it on them right to like i'm now completely sovereign and in control of my entire financial future and i have to manage all my private keys and make sure i don't get hacked and like, it's just too much of a jump for people so people naturally are going to move to custodial service which is just kind of what's happening now and in order for crypto to be fully realized as far as that vision I, we need to be custodians we need to take responsibility for ourselves because that's what's going to change the world as long as we're blaming someone else for something that we've done nothing's going to change mm -hmm. so when